Okay, so welcome everybody to our 11th seminar in the Algebra, Particles, and Quantum Theory seminar series. I'm pleased to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Marcus Mueller. Marcus is currently a group leader at the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information in Vienna. Marcus completed his PhD at TU Berlin in 2007, and next went on to a postdoctoral position at Perimeter Institute in Canada. Following this, Marcus became junior group leader at Heidelberg University, next an assistant professor at the University of Western Ontario, where he held a much sought after Canada Research Chair in Foundations of Physics. Finally, now Marcus is a group leader at the Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information. Marcus is currently leading a group of four postdocs and PhD students. Together, they investigate problems in quantum foundations through the lens of quantum information. In particular, Marcus and his group have been in pursuit of a derivation of the abstract formalism of quantum theory, starting from simple physical principles. And this is what Marcus will be telling us about today. Now, before I begin, I would like to emphasize that everybody who showed up here today is here to learn. And so I hope everyone feels comfortable enough to raise their hand and ask a question throughout the talk if they have one. If you accidentally ask a silly question, it's not a big deal. You just brush yourself off and try again next time. I would especially like to encourage questions from graduate students, upper level undergraduates and postdocs. Okay, so Marcus, uh, anytime you're ready. Okay, great, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> thanks Cole for uh, introducing me. Anyway, for organizing this nice seminar and for, for inviting me. It's also good to see some, some old friends here tonight, um, including Howard, who will feature in a scientific detective story, <laughs> um, as you will see. Yeah. Um, I should say that most of this is really older work. So this has been done a couple of years ago, but I thought it would be perhaps a good fit um, to connect to this community as well and to see how it would relate to what you, you guys been thinking about. Um, and so I hope I can convey you the kind of fascination of some of that operational thinking that's, that's behind that stuff. So yeah, as I said, um, feel free to ask questions anytime. Um, I should say this is all mathematically rigorous stuff, but I will not say much about the mathematics. I will hide most of the proofs and definitions from you and try to give you pictures and, and explanations that, that should convey the, the main idea behind um, the theorems and, and behind what we've done here. So here's a quick outline of the talk. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, by the way, can you see this annoying? This meeting is being recorded message in front of my slide, or is the slide OK? The slide looks OK to me. Great. OK. <laughs> then only I'm seeing it. That's fine. OK, so, so the overview is as follows. So I will begin by talking about probabilistic theories beyond quantum theory. So in, in what sense can we think of possible statistics or possible physics that's not classical, that's neither classical nor quantum, but somehow more general? Um, and once I've set the stage by defining you and explaining what that means, we can then ask the question, what's so special about quantum theory? And how can we pick out the formalism of quantum theory from this potentially very large landscape of theories from just via some simple principles. And I will give you one example how this can be done. Now, once we have that, um, um, one obvious question is be, what if we change the, the principles a little bit? Can we find other nice theories that are somehow similar to quantum theory and have many beautiful properties but would predict different phenomena and experiments? And this is now the third part of the talk, which is a scientific detective story in some sense featuring Howard on quest for higher order interference. This will also have some overlap with Howard's talk a couple of weeks ago. Uh, fourth part, I will also show you with a little thought experiment how this formalism of probabilistic theories can be used to, to show a structural relation between space and time on the one hand and probabilities of detector click on the other hand. So how the structure of quantum theory is in some sense tied to the structure of space time. Uh, and then in the end, I perhaps have one slide with ongoing work, but as I said, this is all a bit older work. Nonetheless, so what are these probabilistic theories beyond quantum theory? So how can we be more general than quantum? And one way in which we could have more general physics than quantum would be physics that allows for different kinds of Bell um, correlations. So here's a typical way that quantum information scientists like to draw a Bell experiment. 
you have two parties, Alice and Bob. They are very far away in their local laboratories. They share some resource. The resource could be, for example, an entangled state or something else. And then they perform a measurement. Now we're abstracting away from what that measurement really is and just say there's a choice perhaps between two different measurements. And this choice is labeled by a parameter X. X could be zero or one, for example, which could, for example, be a measurement in spin X or in spin Y direction. Uh, then Alice will obtain a local outcome A in her laboratory, perhaps spin up or spin down. And the same for Bob. What you can then determine statistically given your resource is this conditional probability distribution. So you can determine the probabilities of outcomes A and B given settings X and Y. Now, how would we formalize this in classical physics um, or just in everyday um, situations where we have classical probability theory at play? So given the causal structure of the setup, we would say that the shared resource is some random variable, whatever that is, that has been distributed to Alice and Bob. So computer scientists would call it shared randomness. And then you would have local um, probabilities, conditional probabilities, for example, for Alice, PA, and that only depends on Alice's input X and on the variable lambda, but it doesn't depend on Bob's input Y. And you have the same for Bob, and what you see in total is the mixture over the different lambdas, weight, weighted by the probabilities. Now in quantum physics, um, we should say, well, what's, whatever is shared between the two parties is just a quantum state described by a density matrix or maybe a pure state rho AV. You have measurement operators, you have the tensor product perhaps of these two measurement operators, and you compute the outcome probabilities with the trace rule. Now in both cases, um, these probabilities satisfy one condition that's these are the no signaling conditions. And they basically say that you cannot use this to build a bell telephone or just to send information faster than light simply by choosing your measurement. Uh, and what that means is, for example, that the probability of Alice's outcome is independent of Bob's, Bob's choice. Um, if that was so P of A given X and Y is independent of Y. Now, if that was wrong, if it depended on Y, then you can imagine that Bob is just choosing an input and using that to signal something to Alice's laboratory instantaneously. Now, this is forbidden classically and also impossible in quantum theory. But certainly there is a difference between the two, and that is that quantum um, physics allows more general probability distribution, namely those that violate, for example, Bell inequalities. A very famous example is the clauser horn shimony holt inequality. So what you can do here to compute this expression is you look at the expectation value of the product of the two outcomes, A times B, given the settings X and Y. And you compute this expression here of this correlators and you find that classically this is always upper bounded by two, as most of you know. Whereas quantumly, you can violate the spell inequality and get a value of up to two square root of two. Now, in 1994, there was Popescu, Sandu Popescu and Daniel Rohrlich were asking a question. They were asking, well, is this uh, the, the best we could hope for in physics? So are these quantum correlations that give you, in this case, a, a correlation of two square root of two, are these the most general objects that are consistent with the no signaling principle? And in that sense, consistent, say, with relativity. And the perhaps surprising answer is no. You can imagine correlations that are in some sense still stronger than those allowed by quantum theory, but still satisfy the non-signaling principle. An example of the famous PR popesco rohrlich box correlations, where as you see in the last line, if both Alice and Bob choose input one, then they get anti-correlated outcomes, either plus one or minus one with 50% probability. So they get anti-correlation definitely, but in all other three cases that they definitely correlated outcomes. Now this gives you a CHSH value of up to four and four is impossible in quantum theory. So we can imagine that we have these PR boxes and that we'll somehow lie around in our laboratory, but they are impossible to, um, to actually implement um, in a space-like separated way within quantum physics. Now then people have wondered about these sets of correlations. You can certainly classify the classical correlations and distinguish them from the quantum correlations the Bell inequalities, but you can also say, how is this set Q that I've painted blue here, how is this characterized within this larger set of no signaling correlations? 
Now, this is a, a large research area somehow in the quantum foundations, but for now, let's just say that the classical correlations can be interpreted somehow as correlations coming from a specific theory, which is classical probability theory. The correlations in Q would come from quantum theory. In some sense, another beast, uh, and, and another example of a probabilistic theory. And these strange correlations in the no signaling subset also come from a theory that's sometimes called box world. In some sense, an alternative to quantum theory. So these are three examples of what's called a generalized probabilistic theory. And here's a general way to think and motivate the mathematical framework that's underlying them. So typically what's thought of are situations in a laboratory where you have a preparation device, you press a button and then you, some physical system is prepared. You may have a transformation device, maybe this switches a magnetic field or something like that. And in the end you have a measurement where you can read off some outcome. Now classical coin tosses would be described for example as follows, you push the button and then the preparation device shakes some, uh, something and puts, you know, produces perhaps a biased or fair coin. Maybe the transformation device could, for example, turn it around and move heads to tails and tails to heads. And then the measurement device perhaps only looks whether it's heads or tails, and if it's heads, it flashes red. Now, mathematically, you would say what comes out of the preparation device is a state. It's a vector, in this case of two components, which would be the probability of hats and the probability of tails, P and one minus P. The trans and this, then you can talk about what's the state space. That would be all possible ways you could prepare a coin in. So here would be the state space of a coin. The fair coin would have probabilities 50-50 that would somehow sit in the middle. That would be a state in the middle of the line segment here. A deterministic coin that always shows hats is on top and a deterministic coin always showing tails would be on the bottom. So as you can see, this would be the state space of a classical coin. A transformation, the one I described, would, for example, rotate the coin around. And this would be a linear map on your state space, basically. Now, uh, would map states to states and would be a linear map. Now, what about the measurement outcomes? Well, they have some probability. So they are something like dual vectors. They depend linearly on your state and they give you a number. In this case, you would say the probability of, for example, hats, given the state that you prepared, is just the inner product of the vector one zero with your state. And so this is, um, this is the way with which you compute outcome probabilities by linear functionals that give valid probabilities between zero and one. Uh, quantum spin one half particle would have a similar story. Just now you would say that the preparation device prepares a state that be a quantum state Usually you think of a pure state, but now better you think of a, of a mixed state, which would just be a two by two density matrix. The state space would now look like the famous Bloch ball, where spin up or spin up, for example, would be the North Pole, spin down the South Pole, and then you have the superpositions on the surface of the ball and the mixed state somehow in the middle. Uh, transformations, for example, you could have unitary transformations. What they do is when you Picked, depicted, they rotate this block ball around and a measurement would be given by the trace rule, which is still just a linear functional on your state. So you can see a pattern emerging. You just say, what is a state here? Well, a state is something like a catalog of probabilities. It is just the thing that allows us to determine for all possible measurements that we may want to do later, the probabilities of the possible outcomes. Now, quantum theory, this would be the density matrices. Um, what is a state space? Well, this is really the collection of possible states that a system could possibly be in. Um, it is closed under statistical mixtures. W what does that mean? Well, suppose you toss a die, yeah, and if you get an even outcome, you prepare state omega. But if you get an odd outcome, you prepare state tau, and then you forget your die and throw it away. And effectively, the statistics of this is now described by a new state, which is just one half times omega plus one half times tau. So this means that your state spaces would be convex sets. They would be closed under convex mixtures. And convex mixing is nothing but statistical mixing of states. Quantum theory, again, as I said, this would be, uh, if you have n outcomes, this would be the, um, the n by n Hermitian trace one positive semi-definite matrices, the density matrices. Whereas in classical probability theory with n outcomes, you can really just think of probability vectors with n probabilities. What about a transformation? Well, a transformation is something where a state comes in, another state comes out. 
And it must respect the statistical mixing. Uh, doing it 50-50 with a coin toss should give you 50-50 outcome probabilities. So this means must, it must be a linear map. And you call it reversible if, you, if the inverse is also a transformation. So in quantum theory, the transformations would be the completely positive trace non-increasing maps. And the reversible ones would be exactly the unitary evolutions of your density matrix. How do you describe measurements? Where you say, suppose I have a measurement of, of n outcomes, then I need n linear functionals. And the probability of the ith outcome is just ei of omega. And when you add them all up, you hopefully get probability one. Again, in quantum theory, this is called the positive operator valued measures, just measurement operators that add to the identity and that give you with the trace rule your probabilities. Now, state space could in principle be anything. Uh, so we've seen the classical coin or classical bit. We've seen the quantum bit already. Um, what about a classical three-level system or higher level system? Well, this would be basically the simplices. So a classical trit would be something like a triangle where the three deterministic possibilities are the corners. If you look at a quantum three-level system, it's more interesting. So this is the set of three by three positive semi-definite trace one matrices. And this looks pretty complicated. It's, it's a convex set, it's eight dimensional, it's very symmetric, but has flat pieces on the boundary. It's very hard to depict. Sometimes people start this generalized bit or G bit, which looks like a square, which is neither classical nor quantum, but in principle, you could think of any kind of physical system that's described by whatever convex state space you can imagine. Good, so in principle, you can think of this landscape of state spaces or theories, which would be collections of such state spaces where quantum theory and classical probability theory are just special cases. Yeah, um, turns out that there's, you know, there's quantum theory, um, there's also something called people call box world. This is a theory that features these popesco really super strong uh, correlations, for example, and has a state space that looks like a square, uh, like the you know, signaling polytope. But whatever they are, um, we can now formulate a goal. Um, and our goal is now, given this landscape of theories, can we find a small set of simple principles, maybe information theoretic or physical principles that picks out quantum theory from this landscape of possible probabilistic theories. And the role model for this in some sense is uh, Einstein's derivation um, of Minkowski space-time and of the Lorentz transformations. The Lorentz transformations have long been written down before they have been derived from these two principles, relativity principle and the light postulate. But by deriving them from these two principles, we've learned really a lot about the theory. So perhaps we can do something similar for quantum theory. Now, let me show you an example how this can be done. Uh, this is a reconstruction of quantum theory now in the second part here. Um, just one example, yeah, there's a long prehistory to that. I should mention that many other people have been working on this, in particular, Lucien Hardy has been the first one uh, to, to use inform quantum information theoretic thinking to, to try and arrive at such a reconstruction of quantum theory that many other people have. Um, so perhaps I just not go over the details of that, but rather go to this example. So here's an example how you could reconstruct quantum theory. Let me just tell you what these principles are that pick out quantum theory. So this is in a paper here from, as I said, already a couple of years ago. Um, with Luis Massanes, Remigius Agusiak, and David Perez Garcia. Um, and the first, we have four postulates or principles. Uh, the first postulate is called continuous reversibility. And that postulate says that reversible transformations can, in principle, map every pure state continuously to every other. Now, in this picture, if you think of a spin one half particle in a pure state that's pointing in some direction, you can certainly engineer Hamiltonian unitary time evolution that moves it over to, to the other spin state continuously. This is, this is certainly possible within quantum theory. And here we elevate it to, to a principle. Second one is called tomographic locality. And it tells you something about composite systems. Um, in words, it says that the state of a composite system should be completely characterized by the correlations of measurements done on the individual components. So, so in this picture, think of physicists Alice and Bob, and they share something, some state, perhaps a quantum state or one of these other theories, maybe have a lots of many copies of that state. Now what they want to do is, they want to do some tomography to, to find out what that state is. At first you might think, oh, they have to meet in the middle and do a big entangled measurement to find out what that is. 
But it turns out that that's not necessary. So Alice and Bob can do local measurements and then talk on the telephone to tell them their correlations. And this way they can reconstruct the state. So it tells you sometimes that if you bring two systems to, together, then correlations are characterizing the state of your global system and not other things. Postulate three in this reconstruction is called existence of an information unit. Um, the classical bit and the quantum bit are some of the, the, the paradigms of this. Um, the idea is that there is a type of system, the universal bit. Um, Tipla is asking a question. Yeah, so hey, Marcus. Um, hey. Uh, so the continuous reversibility uh, postulate that you are proposing uh, would that allow, say, um, a neutrino uh, uh, to exist? A neutrino to exist? Um, yeah, because uh, neutrinos, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, they are helicity um, uh, eigenstates, right? And uh, so you can't really flip their helicities, right? I mean, at least in the chiral standard model, um, uh, maybe it's something you uh, don't care about, but it just like popped into my. No, uh, it's, it's a good question. So, so let me rephrase it to, to see that, that it, I understand it correctly. So what you do not allow get here, what, what you do get here in the end is, is really Hilbert space quantum theory. Um, or later on, you will get an, an irreducible factor of a, of a Jordan algebra. So you, you do not get systems with super selection rules, for example, here. So you may have systems where you have some superpositions are physically disallowed due to a super selection rule, for example, then these would violate um, continuous reversibility. In the worst case, it would just be classical and then there's no way you can move one classical eigenstate to the other continuously. So, so somehow this is the gold standard uh, Hilbert space quantum theory that we get without restrictions or super selection sectors and so on. Does that answer your question? We also have another question. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess, uh, yeah, if Tibor wants to answer again, I guess he can, he can raise his hand. So uh, Andreas Tretner has a, has a question. So yeah, I actually had exactly the same question. And so I was ask, I was wondering how to formulate it better, <laughs> but maybe let me just jump on it. So in principle, it would allow, I would not allow like say a direct product spaces. Right. If you have a state which is just in one space, you cannot continuously rotate it to the other. Um, well, yes. I mean, it, it, just in quantum theory, when you have a product system A, B, and you have a product basis, then you would certainly need entangling unitary operations to move it over to any other um, pure state. But in principle, for every fixed Hilbert space, no matter what it, how it is set up in space, how you think of it as divided into factors, the, the unitary group is transitive on your pure states. And that's all that that says. Mm. Yeah. So this is really very abstract. So it's a bit like, you know, um, so not much physics is in here. I'm not talking about specific Hamiltonians or the standard model. This is a much more modest goal through the bare abstract Hilbert space formalism that I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, this is the formalism that predicts two square root of two as the maximum for a Bell violation instead of four, but it is completely silent about which Hamiltonian we should assign on, in physics or other such questions. No, this is a very much more modest goal here. Oh, but it seems like I can easily come up with a state in nature, like in QFT. I mean, which basically, I mean, has uh, the quantum theory underlying, right? So I could come up with a state that I could not continuously turn to any other state. This is yes, just that's the, right. what was the previous uh, question, I think. Yes. So I haven't shown you a theorem yet, <laughs> and I would have mentioned it. This is certainly finite dimensional Hilbert space quantum theory. <laughs> now you may say, well, I'm not interested in that because in the end we have infinite dimensional systems and we have operator algebras and whatnot. Um, still, I think that once you understood operational reasons for why you have finite dimensional quantum theory, you can then say, well, it's, it's um, plausible that I see in the world some kind of infinite limit of that with some limit procedure that I have to work out the mathematical details with some effort, but at least I've understood the, the main building block or the phenomenology of quantum information theory here. Thanks. Yeah, but yeah, I should say this is all finite dimensional. So thanks for the question. 
So this will also see here now in this postulate, we say that there is a type of system, the universal bit, so that every system can be encoded into a sufficiently large number of such bits. So, so what does it mean? Well, you have a state omega here um, of a maybe 10 level system. Yeah? And then you can take four qubits, then you can somehow move the state, you can unitarily encode it into these four qubits and you can also unitarily go back. Now, this is also true in classical probability theory. You can encode every um, probability distribution of a finitely many outcomes into classical bits. Um, and this constraints turns out a lot about what your theory could be. What we also um, assume here is that if you have two of these universal bits that they can continuously reversibly interact. So, so I get back to that later. So you say, well, I have two bits here and if they can only um, independently um, evolve and say in a product evolution, this would be a very boring theory. I want them to be able to interact in one way or the other. All right. um, good, now let me go to the fourth part. Perhaps this will get a bit clearer when I, when I get to this again. Uh, the last postulate that we use here is somehow says that the universal bit should really be a bit. It should be described two alternatives. So if a universal bit is used to perfectly encode one classical bit, then it cannot simultaneously also encode any further information. Yeah. Um, this goes a bit back to Zeilinger. It says once you have read out two classical bits from a qubit, then you've randomized it completely. Like this, everything you, you learned that was, was there to be learned in the first place. Uh, I tell you a bit in a proof sketch in one slide, perhaps how this comes, comes about here. Yeah. But you can now prove the following theorem once you formulate these principles in a sufficiently mathematical way uh, that you say that if these four postulates hold, then the state space of n universal bits must be exactly that of n qubits. So your state space omega is up to a linear reparameterization is the same as the two to the n by two to the n density matrices. And the reverse of the transformations of your theory must be exactly the unitary conjugations. So you do recover um, quantum theory in this finite dimensional setting exactly from these four postulates. Now, let me give you a, just a glimpse of an idea how they can do this. For example, why, how can we understand that bits like qubits are described by a ball and not by another convex set? And for these, we only need two principles, which is continuous reversibility and no simultaneous encoding. Um, and so first of all, um, continuous reversibility says you all pure states are related by such a reversible transformation. Now, what does group representation theory tell you? If you have groups acting linearly on some space, then you can always reparameterize the space so that your transformations become orthogonal maps, so they become rotations. What this means is you can pick one pure state and then orthogonally rotate it around, and you can cover all the other pure states with that. And this tells you that the pure states must be a submanifold of the, of the unit sphere of whatever your space is that carries your state space. It doesn't have to be the full sphere, but a part of the sphere. Now, suppose it's, it's actually a full ball, suppose that for now, then it turns out that this really encodes one bit. You can then by measurement always distinguish perfectly two antipodal points on your ball, like in the Bloch ball spin up and spin down. Um, but if it's not the full ball, then you can distinguish a bit more. So here would be a situation where you get only part of the ball, then you can encode one bit by either preparing omega zero or omega one, but you could also have prepared omega one prime. This would give you an extra freedom that allows you to encode a little bit more than one bit of information into your state and would then violate postulate four. Yeah. Um, now you can ask why is the block bit now a three dimensional? <laughs> We've just seen it should be a ball, but it could be a ball of any dimension that we don't know yet. And this is now where it becomes interesting. For that, you have to now look at two of these universal bits. You know these are d-dimensional balls. You don't know the dimension. You say there is some composite state space that you don't know. You basically know nothing. But you know that whatever you can do locally, it's basically rotations that are transitive on your sphere. And tomographic locality tells you that how many parameters a state has of your total system. You don't know what the global states are, but you can count parameters and say that these are D squared correlations and then 2D local parameters. And then you can show the following theorem. So if you just go through all possible dimensions and all possible groups that are transitive on such a ball, 
then you get only two kinds of solution. The first one is a trivial solution that whatever you can do on the first ball and whatever you can do on the second ball are completely unrelated. So these are product transformations. But the second case is that if you have a three ball and only in this case, um, you do get a larger possible group. And this group really acts like the conjugation with a four by four unitary matrix. And it turns out the state space that you get is an equivalent to the cube, two qubit quantum state space. Um, here, we've never inserted complex numbers by hand. So it just show that you get a convex set from these principles that you can linearly map to this set here of, of complex matrices. So in particular, you can only have continuous reversible interaction between two of these ball state spaces if the ball is three-dimensional, like the qubit in quantum theory is three-dimensional. Yeah. Proof idea, well, maybe just go through it. You say, well, I suppose I, have, I do some transformation. I do only a little bit by an epsilon, and then I have to have probabilities between zero and one. You get a bunch of constraints on your generators, and then it turns out if dimension is not three, these generators must only generate only local transformations. And dimension three, you have more possibilities. In the end, it boils down to the fact that the rotation group um, in one dimension less, so, so mathematically in the end, what you find is that SOD minus one, that group being non-trivial and commutative only in three dimensions, it's what make the three ball special. But yeah, I, let me, yeah. Okay, so this is one possible way how you get quantum theory here. Now, what about the detective story that I promised <laughs> um, featuring Howard? So, so here's the idea of higher order interference. This would be yet another phenomenon that goes beyond quantum theory and that was proposed by Raphael Sorkin in 1994. Um, I should probably skip lots of things for time reasons, but let me explain this for now because I think it's, it's interesting. So uh, the idea is that um, here's something that you learn when you, when you learn quantum theory, when you have a double slit experiment, then there's something weirdly, apparently non-classical about the situation. So when you think of two possible slits and then say a like an event like a detector click and you ask what's the probability of this detector click, then you can say, well, let's look at this probability if only one of these two slits is open and the other one is blocked. Let's call this click probability P1. In the other case, let's call this click probability P2. And then we can look at P12, which would be the situation when both of these slits are open. Now, in classical probability theory, you would expect if the situation is properly phrased that the probabilities really just add up. But in quantum theory, we do find cases where they do not add up, and that's exactly what we call interference. Sorkin would call that second order interference because it's a phenomenon related to a double slit. You can now go to a more general situation, look at a triple slit, for example. Triple slit, um, you will find something curious now. Yeah, so you can play the same game. You can look at the click probability for one of the slits open or two of the slits open or three of the slits open. And when you do this, you find out something curious that both in classical and quantum theory, the probability P123, if all your three slits are open, can be decomposed in this specific way. So you can compute it from just from the pairwise and single probabilities. And this is what Sorkin called the absence of third order interference. So like in principle, phenomenologically, this need not be the same. And we could think of physics where this is different. In this case, we would have third order interference, but quantum theory in appropriate situations that we model with this here predicts that it is the same. And there is no third order interference of this kind. You can ask why, <laughs> why is this not the case? And the idea is a bit like, well, we describe this thing by, by three orthogonal possibilities. And so the which path information is contained in a three by three density matrix. And if you block, for example, this third slit, what this does is it introduces zeros in your density matrix. Yeah, it's like projection. And then every density matrix can be decomposed in that way. Yeah, the three blobs it just decompose it into these blocks here of two by two. And then you subtract the diagonal elements that you counted twice. That's just a fancy way of writing this equation here from Sorkin. Yeah. Classical probability theory is even simpler. Now your objects are just probability vectors, and then you can just decompose it in that simple way, which tells you that you don't have classical interference. But uh, 
Um, actually, some of these general probabilistic theories do exhibit and predict third order interference, as Cosman knows, who's here in the audience from his PhD thesis. For example, if your state space it looks like a pillow, no idea how Cosman found it, <laughs> um, then this would predict third order interference. Because uh, maybe there are other, maybe natural modifications of quantum theory that, that would predict this, not just these ad hoc constructions. I think if you're an ad hoc state space predictor, this is a natural, simple one that I could somehow expect perhaps to describe alternative physics or something like that would be very similar to quantum theory. And you could think of people have speculated, well, you know, classically you have something like a vector of probabilities, quantumly you have something like a tensor of rank two, perhaps needed something like a tensor of rank three or so to describe states in a theory that predict third order interference. And here comes another detective story. Uh, it goes back to, to another axiomatization of quantum theory with Cosman and Howard, who are both in the audience. Um, where we where we say, hey, look, Jordan algebras and quantum theory can be also reconstructed from the following. Um, I give you to talk about this. Let me first tell you what a frame is. A frame is something like an orthonormal system in quantum theory. It's just a set of pure and perfectly distinguishable states. Yeah. Um, quantum theory again, it's an orthonormal system, but you can talk about this in any kind of theory. And our first postulate here for a maximization of quantum theory tells you that every state should be a mixture of, of frame states. So when you have a state omega, you can write it as a statistical mixture of perfectly distinguishable pure states. So in quantum theory, it would be nothing like the spectral decomposition of your density matrix. It's also true classically. And the second postulate tells you when you have two of these frames, then they should always be related by a reversible transformation. So in some sense, there's a strong symmetry in your state space that relates all the possible frames with each other. In, in finite dimensional quantum theory, this is true because every two orthonormal bases are related by a unitary map. Third principle, there is no third order interference of the kind I've described. Yeah. Um, and it turns out, and this is what you've shown in this paper, that if you throw, assume these three postulates, then there are only a couple of general probabilistic theories that satisfy it which is on the one hand classical probability theory, and then quantum theory over the real numbers, the complex numbers or the quaternions, or the three by three octonionic density matrices, which is certainly related to the, to the Albert algebra, the Jordan algebra here, or something like Bloch balls or qubits, ball states, bases of arbitrary dimension. So these are, I, I get back to that in a slide, these are the state space of the formally real, um, irreducible Jordan algebras and classical theory. But let me first go further in my detective story. So now we have these three principles that determine quantum theory and its cousins in a way. Then we can ask, can we play a game? Uh, let's, let's drop the third postulate. Suppose I just throw that away. And then I work out what, what the solutions are now. One possibility is that when you drop that, you find new theories that are not Jordan algebras, but that still satisfies postulate one and postulate two. So these would be very beautiful theories that are very similar to quantum theory in a way. So these would be theories that predict actually higher order interference in these experiments. Um, turns out that they have a lot of quantum features. They would also give you orthogonal projectors like you have in quantum theory. The faces of these state spaces would correspond to an orthomodular lattice that people in quantum logic like and would satisfy a couple of other things. But if a weird feature, sometimes when you project uh, a pure state, we would get a mixed state and so on. So, um, yeah, what, what's uh, here? So, uh, yeah, Howard and Cosman and I, and we've been thinking a lot about this. Um, so like detectives, we have looked for the murderer, right? It could be, a, we've looked at a couple of suspects uh, suspected theories that could satisfy this and could be, you know, beyond Jordan, new physical theories that we have so far overlooked. Um, until Howard published a paper that he also talked about in, in this seminar series here, shows that um, strongly spectral symmetric, con strongly symmetric spectral convex bodies are Jordan algebra state space. So the answer is no, there are no new theories, unfortunately. So here, if you go to <laughs> Uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I must say that um, I was Dr. Watson with a red shirt. I've looked for the, for the murderer who just doesn't exist, whereas Howard was the Sherlock Holmes who finally solved the case. 
Unfortunately, these theories do not exist. It also tells you that these two postulates completely characterize the state spaces of classical probability theory and also of the simple Euclidean shortened algebras, which is perhaps interesting for this community and something that Howard has also talked about already. Good. Um, let me now for the last five minutes um, go briefly to a thought experiment just to see what else you can do with this kind of thinking perhaps. Um, now, at some point in this talk, I've already shown you that it, that we get pretty easily from simple assumptions that when you have a bit, a, a two level system, it should probably be described by a state space that's something like a Euclidean ball. Uh, the three ball would really describe the Bloch ball of quantum theory. The one dimensional ball is something like the classical bit, but you could have balls of different dimension. It turns out that quantum theory over the real complex quaternions and octonions would also be described by balls, but of dimension two, three, five, and nine, for example. But also the other dimensions would be in principle possible could describe a system within these channel probabilistic theories. And you can ask, why do we have three balls in our world? Uh, We've already seen that we can derive this from principles, but maybe there's a simpler way to see this with a thought experiment, um, which has to do with space and time, perhaps, um, in a very simple way. And this is a paper with, with Andy Garner and Oscar Dalston, also a couple of years ago already, um, which is, describes a very simple situation. So we have something like a Machzehnder interferometer. Think of an interferometer that has two arms, the upper arm and the lower arm, and the particle can be on one path or the other, so it's something like a bit. Now you can think of a d-dimensional Bloch ball or Bloch sphere that describes where your particle is sitting. If d is three, then this is really the quantum situation. So that'd be a situation where your north pole state describes a particle that's definitely in the upper branch. Uh, south pole state, a particle that's definitely in the lower branch. If you think of a state that's somehow on the equator, then you would be in a state where you find it with 50, 50% 50 probability when you look where it sits. Yeah. Um, so it, since probabilities must be linear, this only leaves one possibility. So the probability of finding in the upper branch must have to do with this Z component of your ball. Uh, it must be basically given by this simple equation here. Now you can ask, well, what? suppose I'm a physicist and I'm sitting close to one of the arms and perhaps I can put a little piece of glass in one of the arms or something like this. So what could be these transformations that I can do to one of these arms if I do it locally and I do it reversibly so that I can undo it without any information loss. Now, certainly when you look at the state space, this must somehow rotate this d-dimensional ball in a certain way. And if you do it locally, then it cannot change the probability that you find the particle there. So it must preserve the probability of sitting in the upper branch, which means it must preserve the z-axis of this thing. Yeah. But you could also think of another observer, Bob, a physicist Bob, who's doing the same in the other branch, and the same applies to, to him. Now, um, the most general thing you can imagine is that you have all the possible rotations of your Bloch ball that fix the z-axis. And that's the rotation group of one dimension less. That's S or D minus one. Yeah. But now suppose your friend comes along um, and flies by in a spaceship and looks at your setup and says, ah, you have your Alice and Bob. And ah, interesting, Alice is doing her transformation first and then Bob is doing his transformation. Um, but then the other friend comes along and says, no, it's actually the other way around. It's first Bob that's acting and then Alice is acting here on my setup. So you'd say, well, both observers agree on the detector click probabilities in the end, which means that the transformations that you can do here, they must commute on your state space. Yeah. So all the, the rotations of your Bloch ball must commute in S or D minus one. Now, certainly rotations do not commute in dimension three or higher. So this tells you that the Bloch ball can only have dimension three or less. And three is exactly the one that we find for, for a qubit that describes the rich path information in quantum theory. Yeah, you can, uh, again, here we find the same reason for the three-dimensionality of the Bloch ball that we found mathematically in the derivation from principles, which is a bit curious. Uh, it seems to boil down to the fact that the rotation group in D minus one dimension is non-trivial and commutative. Only for dimension three seems to have something to do with it. Let me maybe skip this now. Let me just say that you can be a bit more general. And instead of assuming that you can do all these transformations in both arms, you can just say, let's only 
assume that whatever Ellison can do in one arm, whatever Bob can do in one arm are isomorphic as groups. And then you find that you get one other possibility that survives and that's quaternionic quantum theory. So you can classify the possibilities that you get and a bunch of assumptions that you make for your beam splitters. Perhaps I won't read them all now. I basically say, you know, the beam splitter can prepare whatever probability you want in both branches. Um, groups of operations that Alice and Bob can do are isomorphic and one has to do with, um, I can implement everything reversibly. And then this, um, when you assume this kind of relativity of simultaneity that I've assumed that Alice and Bob commute, you get only these possibilities here. So your, your rich path information must be described either by classical bit, by quantum theory over the real numbers or over the, over the complex numbers or over the quaternions. So you get the associative division algebras basically from, from, from this thought experiment here. That's the only possibility is how your detector click probabilities could be in the end be described by a state space. All right, so um, with that, let me finally conclude. I think at the end of my time anyway. Um, now, now, now what, I, what I've shown you maybe in the last part is, is somehow a, a modest goal of getting a little piece of puzzle to understanding the logical structure of our world. And, and that's a bit the funny picture I like to draw, like the philosophy behind it. So some of us believe that what we see now, quantum theory and general relativity are just some approximations of some fundamental unknown underlying theory, whatever that is. Um, and now you could go ahead and try to quantize gravity, um, but you could have a much more modest goal. You could first try to study the logical architecture of physics and say, how are these two theories related to each other? How do they constrain each other? If I wiggle one of them, how would the other have to wiggle in these little simple thought experiments? Um, yes, so let me just finish the slide and then I can go to the question perhaps. So this is mustn't overlook. Okay, but I don't say much of this is something you do with my group now is try to use these ideas to build randomness generation protocols that do not depend on the formalism of quantum theory, but only on, on spatial temporal symmetries. But yeah, um, anyway, so I'm anyway at the end of my talk. <laughs> so perhaps I give you the summary slide for now and then I'm happy to answer your questions. So summary is basically this. I think Jordan algebraic quantum theory can be derived from simple principles and this improves our understanding of its structure in several ways. I want to thank Cole again for organizing. I want to thank my collaborators, in particular Howard and Louis Massanes, and my, my group here in, in Vienna. Okay, and that's it. And thank you for your patience. And I'm happy to answer more questions now. Thank you so much, Marcus, for such a great talk. Um, you already uh, do have some questions here. So I'll, um, we'll go straight to it. So to Ginger, you've got a question. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. That was uh, so nice and thought provoking. Uh, so, you know, I would like to look focus on your last slide where you suggested the possibility of your underlying theory from which uh, quantum theory and gravity are emergent. Do you, have you probably know the work of Stephen Adler on trace dynamics and quantum theory as an emergent phenomenon? So, uh, you know, what is being done there is very nice. Classical degrees of freedom are made into operators, but the Heisenberg algebra is not imposed a priori. It emerges in a certain thermodynamic approximation so that your underlying theory is more general. And some of us have tried to include gravity into trace dynamics. And one very interesting feature which comes out is that quantum systems do not live in four dimensional space time. They live a certain, in a certain higher dimensional space time, where, say something like octonionic, and the extra dimensions effectively play the role of a wormhole, which allows a non-local quantum influence through those extra di dimensions while st staying completely consistent with special relativity in 4D. No signaling in 4D, but an effective signaling in the higher dimensions. Uh, this could be a reason, a way of raising the CSHS to 4 if you have extra dimensions. Do you have any thoughts on, uh, has anyone done something? Have you thought about this? Uh, it's a good question. I'm certainly sympathetic in general to, to think about and ponder about quantum theory being emergent from something else. 
Now, what I know is about people who think about quantum theory somehow emerging from classical systems. They want to write down differential equations very early on that resemble the classical mechanics or so. And so you, you do get structures that, that resemble perhaps symplectic structure and things like this, which perhaps bring you more naturally already to parts of the quantum formalism than they would bring you to um, these PR boxes, for example. Yeah. Even PR boxes would have, for example, the property that there is no continuous time evolution. They could only reversibly evolve like discreetly in time. And um, the way you described it seems to me like you build in continuity and several other things that would perhaps most more, more lead to, to quantum theory than other probabilistic theories. But I don't know too much about, about this approach to be really, uh, to be able to give you a really good answer to this. No, no problem. I'll write to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Tevian has a question here. So my question is, if you could go back to the slide with the theorem right at the end. This one. Yes. So I'd like to point out, you started off with some conditions that led to the standard sort of complex situation. Then you changed the conditions and got the quaternionic result. My question, of course, is what else would you have to change to be able to include an octonionic example here? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, and I, I do not know, to be honest. So I have to say that the, the possibility of this quaternionic quantum bit is something we found out, out only very late, where we got back to our assumptions that, wait a minute, if we just assume that Alice and Bob can do the same transformations, um, this is assuming already some kind of relationality. Bob can undo what Alice does in all cases. Maybe you don't want to assume this. Just say whatever stuff Alice has, there's a kind of isomorphic collection of stuff that Bob has. But we first had to get there and get this idea. Yeah. So you probably need a new idea to get to the, on the octonionic uh, bit. Um, in the end, still, I think that relativity of simultaneity forces you to commuting groups for Alice and for Bob. And then there are not so many possibilities living inside these balls. Only the, the quaternionic quantum bit is already interesting because you have a kind of a four ball sitting inside the five ball. And in this four ball, you have the left and the right isoclinic rotations making up what Alice and Bob is doing. So, um, yeah, a new idea. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so Andreas uh, has a question here. Go ahead. Um, am I, I'm yeah, okay. Um, yeah, just coming a little bit back to the, the, the discussion we had before. So, um, in this postulate that you had for the third order related to the third order entanglement, can you show them again? Because you use a, as a second postulate. I mean, first of all, let me understand. I mean, uh, what you're saying is if you have third order entanglement, um, you don't need a density matrix, but you would need kind of a density high order tensor, right? Or something like that. Yeah, I've only, I've only motivated in a hand-waving way. Uh, there's no mathematical model for this, really. There's a preliminary work by Chaslav Buchner, but I don't think anybody has written down a consistent state space. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the three postulates you had. So the second postulate, again, uses this, um, that every frame is related uh, by, uh, to any other frame by a reversible transformation. And yeah. again, you think of, of unitary rotations, I guess. For example, yes. Yeah, but what if I, I mean, if I just do a reflection, I mean, this is, obviously I would believe that um, that I can relate my frame with a reflection to another frame, which in the end should describe exactly the same physics. So mm, when you think of the qubit, for example, the Bloch ball, then a reflection um, would be described by an anti-unitary map. And we know that anti-unitary maps are not standalone maps that you can actually apply to a system because if we did this to half of an entangled state, you would obtain negative probabilities. So uh, in this case, quantum theory would not have this reflection in this case, but uh, maybe you mean something else with the reflection? No, but it's I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think necessarily reflection has to be reflection in the Bloch sphere, but um, in the space of states. Um, well, yes. So, I mean, the thing is, it doesn't have to be the set of so I'm not I mean, What I have in mind, I think it would be yeah. probably a, a system which has two block spheres and the reflection relates to block spheres. I, I would think this would be the better. Um... So, I would, we'll probably discuss on the side. Now, if when I think of two block spheres, maybe I think of a, 
a direct sum of two block spheres or something like a super selection. Exactly what, exactly, what, uh, exactly what I said before about the, about the Hilbert spaces that you exclude by this postulate. Yes. So here, what you do have, and this I should mention, is that you get the state spaces of the simple Euclidean Jordan algebras. So these are not direct sums of those. So these are not, so for example, ones with super selection rules. But like the gold standard, the really full Hilbert space, we have the full unitary symmetry, uh, the state space of quaternionic quantum theory with the full symplectic symmetry. So, so Howard, please correct me. Maybe you, you can say more about this, but um, there could, I'm not sure if reflections exist in some of them that could be, um, I don't think I get exactly what you point at when you mention these reflections. Yeah, no, I, I think that, I mean, yeah, in the case where you had two quantum systems that were non-trivial and you had a direct sum of them, yeah, this, this postulate says that you can't interchange them, uh, it implies that you can't interchange them, even though that is a reversible transformation. Um, so I think it just wouldn't satisfy these principles, yeah. Again, as I said, what these axiomatizations do is they do not give you, I mean, you find in physics super selected systems, but you certainly find whatever comes out of a quantum channel, which is kind of a noisy system, for example, you find all kinds of effective state spaces in the world that do not satisfy these principles. What, what these do is somehow, they give you the ones within which you usually think of formulating um, finite dimensional quantum theory mm -hmm. abstractly without I mean, specifying much physics. You could just say, always take n copies of this, this is what you say, right? And for, to think it for each space separately and you're fine. As long as, I mean, what you call super selection, just, I mean, I mean there's a clear quantum number yeah. that is conserved, which tells me in which of these spaces I am. And then you, then, then uh, yeah, I'm settled, yeah. That's yes, it. you could say, well, it's not surprising that in nature you find direct sums of these. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. With a certain okay. probability thanks, of one thanks of Thanks for, for the very nice thought, it was, it was amazing. Thank you. Okay, so Jens has a question. Hey, uh, yeah, thank you for uh, the nice uh, talk and your different sets of axioms, how you can arrive at quantum theory. Now, I, I just want to confirm. So I saw the word Minkowski and I heard you say the word special rel relativity, but you are still in the works of trying to see how space time or whatever space time geometry constraints quantum theories or vice versa is that correct uh yes but only very modestly so uh -huh. um so this is really uh, this is a very simple thought experiment it doesn't really use much of minkowski space time sure sure no um, okay. yeah yeah so you're, you're you're treating the quantum system it is given it lives in some space uh to be clarified and we can say hey i put this in space time and then I yes. get physics out of it. Okay, that's that. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah, you could also say, well, you know, maybe in protocols, and that was a bit my last slide, which just have a kind of advertisement sketch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't want to assume my underlying theory, but I definitely know that I have these devices and I rotate them around in some under, underlying space time here. Maybe this is already enough to guarantee that without assuming the theory that my measurement must produce random outcomes or something like this. Sure. Right? Sure. The idea yeah, is that, like, yeah. yeah, perhaps you can talk about measurement outcome probabilities without assuming the full machinery of quantum theory and develop some kind of formalism for how to do this under very right, right. pure yeah, assumption. A, and of course, we, I mean, we all look at this, uh, that's why we're here, this tantalizing uh, uh, analogy of the properties of space time and the properties of the algebra you're using here. But that's yeah. why we're here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so Howard has a question. Yes. Um, so this was a question about, I think, your last theorem where you allowed the quaternionic state space in. Um, I just wanted to get a little clearer about the assumptions. Mm -hmm. So you have these groups, Alice's group and Bob's group. Um, yes. But the state space is a space with two perfectly distinguishable alternatives that are whether you're in the upper branch or the lower branch of the interferometer, is that correct? That's right, yes. Okay, and then 
these groups are supposed to be transformations on that entire state space that can be done in one branch or in the other branch. Is that also right? Yes, that's right. So Alice's can be done in the, say, the upper branch and Bob's can be done in the lower branch. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, okay, then you assume that these are isomorphic. Do you assume that each of these acts transitively on the state space? Um, or in can some it be sense. So, like, could you have the trivial group and still satisfy? Yeah. So this is a bit a postulate A two here. So what A two says ah, that okay, okay. every pure state with the same upper branch probability P can be prepared by a sequence of operations of Alice and Bob. And this is because in order to say anything interesting, you have to exclude the possibility that you have a 700 ball and then 697 degrees of freedom are just hidden and never interacting in your experiment. So somehow you have to say at some point that what you want to describe is the effective state space that describes the phenomenology of your setup. And so this is exactly what you said. And that's why we have here this postulate okay. too. Yeah. And I guess obviously it's reasonable to rule out um, Alice doing things that change the probability on Bob's arm. <laughs> yes. that, that would be um, presumably violating the space time constraints. Yeah, it's some version of no signaling in some sense. Um, right. because, yeah. Okay. And and there's no assumptions in here of these are all the assumptions. There's no local tomography or or anything like that. No, nothing like that. And it's a bit unusual because most people think of composite systems as these by tensor products or by symmetric monoidal categories. And but this is a bit of a different description where you don't, for example, talk about local modes here one and there one, and then it can be entangled, but you, you take the effective description, which is of the rich path degree of freedom. And so in, a, in the end, that your transformations will be non-local things acting on both, but then you can ask, what about the local ones among those? And then you get these subgroups, they should, and those should commute. But you do assume that the state space of this which path degree of freedom is a ball? Yes, yes. Okay. Great, because I, I mean, it's a really, really cool result. So I really want to understand. Exactly yeah, the problem is if you have three, say you have three of them, then it's, I have no idea what the, what kind of candidates for three level state spaces we should look at that have an infinite family. That's, that's why it's constrained to two paths so far. Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Okay, so it Thanks. looks like, oh, yeah. All right, so it looks like uh, Cause has a question. Go ahead, Cause. Uh, yeah, hey, Marcus. <clears throat> maybe on that last point, I guess you haven't thought about generalizing this to three paths and putting similar kinds of conditions on the commutativity of these operations on, let's say, each pair of paths and then like a larger set of two paths and the third path. So trying to constrain sort of going in the direction of third order interference if you could constrain those state spaces, maybe this would be a different way to prove the kind of result that Howard had, or maybe that's no longer necessary now, but maybe there's a way to do that, to get a sense of like what happens with third order interference um, in relation to this group structure. Yeah, I think I've never done that, but it would be an interesting idea to do this when you think if I pick out a pair, I can still describe that by a ball state space, it's somehow part of the bigger, whatever state space the big thing is. Yeah. And then you work out constraints about what the big thing could be. And then you could perhaps also rule out theories that how it rules out differently. Um, yeah, but it's a bit cumbersome and I haven't, haven't tried this. Yeah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks. Okay. One second. There we go. Uh, so to Ginger has got another question here, go ahead. But, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to make a more general remark, namely that uh, we assume that in quantum mechanics, uh, classical space time is a given. However, we can strictly talk of a classical space time only when the universe is dominated by macroscopic classical objects. And on that, we have a sprinkling of quantum systems. Now suppose that you had a universe, even at low energies, which has only purely quantum systems, no classical background to give us a space time. Then we are forced to look for 
a formulation of quantum theory in which there is no classical time parameter, no classical space time. We have a pre quantum theory, so to say. And here, in my opinion, even at low energies, we do not have a choice. We must look for such a formulation. And quantum phenomena really do not happen in space time, which is why, you know, Bruckner is talking of an indefinite causal structure. Quantum non-locality is a manifest example that quantum phenomena do not happen on a classical space time. So this pre-quantum theory, in my opinion, is what one should look for to see if CSHS goes on up to four. I'm fully with you that I think there is a deep thing to understand why it's two root two for quantum theory, whereas uh, four is allowed and there must be some implications, perhaps of the kind I'm saying that pre-quantum theories will push CSHS up to four. So just to get a bit of understanding what, what you again mentioned as a pre-quantum theory, um, are you not talking about basically just quantum theory without external clocks, like in the page footers formulas, or are you talking about, again, about having quantum theory as an emerging phenomenon from, from a kind of classical- Both phenomenon. go together, both go both together. together. It turns out if you try to remove classical time, you do get a more general theory than quantum theory, something like a deterministic non-unitary dynamics. Mm -hmm. So that the projection postulate of one Neumann and the Schrodinger dynamics are together combined into one deterministic but non-unitary dynamics, which upon coarse graining appears to be random under certain circumstances that we call measurements. But for other circumstances, it's a unitary evolution. So this underlying theory, which is what Adler really has, deterministic non-unitary theory, in that sense, it's different from classical dynamics because non-unitary. And what is the nature of quantum co of these correlations in such a theory? I think is a very interesting uh, problem. I don't know if anyone has looked at it. Yeah, but it sounds interesting. You know, I mean, certainly when you when you have a claim to be made about quantum theory arriving as some approximation or as an effective theory from some some underlying stuff that you postulate, then um, you, you make your claim more believable when you say, well, by the way, here's how you can really understand from my approach how I get this quantum phenomenon and not this post-quantum phenomenon. Right, yes. So this, I think this is, this is a healthy uh, way to, to go and to try. Uh, it's sometimes something I say to the, to the many worlds people. I mean, I'm not so much into interpretations of quantum theory, but sometimes uh, get into colleagues who are very Everettians and they say, oh, come on, you know, your measurement outcomes and preparations and so on. You should talk about the big quantum state and uh, have a realist view of it. And then they say, okay, yes, uh, but why why not do the following? Why, why not come up with a framework of theories of many worlds and a couple of principles? And you show that it picks out exactly quantum theory. Yeah, yeah. and so, to my understanding, they have not proved the Born rule till today despite claims in many worlds, uh, how to prove the bond rule? Why, why is there collapse and why is there the bond probability rule? Um, yes, I mean, all I can say to this is that here, it would be a very different approach. Yeah. I agree. You assume probabilities right away as a phenomenon to appear in your laboratory. And then you, once you, you have the structure of your state space, then the structure of how to get these probabilities is kind of determined already by duality, basically, and this was the born rule. I agree. I agree. Okay, so uh, Kirk has a, um, a question here. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to bring back up uh, Professor Dre's point about loosening any of these putative axioms in order to achieve something a little more octonionic. Would loosening that isomorphic constraint to something perhaps a bit more homeomorphic allow for that? Say lo loosening which constraint, sorry? Yeah, A3 for the strict isomorphism yes. instead by relaxing it into something homeomorphic so that there is some type of bicontinuous or incontinuous process. Um, 
It's a good question. I, I really would have to speculate. Yeah. Probably methodologically, I would first just take the octonionic bit and try to model the situation here in a consistent way and then back engineer axioms that bring you to it. <laughs> okay. Um, be because I personally don't have a good understanding of the structure of the octonionic bit, but it might help you to say what are the subgroups, how could I interpret the subgroups as pertaining to perhaps different different agents or different subregions or things that physicists could do. And then maybe you can come up with a, a nice thought experiment or operational story to tell that motivates this very choice of groups. But it would go backwards. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so it looks like uh, Howard has another question. Go ahead. Oh, it was just a comment on the last um, question and Tevian's uh, question, which is that, um, you know, although we know what the octonionic bit and trit uh, would naturally be, we don't really, as far as I know anyway, have good candidates for higher on higher dimensional octonionic systems. Um, and so maybe that's somehow related to the fact that um, it doesn't seem to be easy to get the octonions to pop out in this um, particular argument. But you know, I'd be very curious if somebody could figure out some state spaces that would naturally be um, interpreted as octonionic um, higher dimensional systems. I mean. The tricky thing is obviously that the octonions aren't associative and when you get above dimension three that makes it hard to even find the nice group structure for the transformations um so we don't really know what to do but if anybody who specializes in octonions does have an idea that would be that would be cool it would have to go beyond jordan algebras obviously one thing that people might consider is that um, you can look at the um, the multiplication algebras of the of the octonions, so either the left or right multiplication algebra, and um, that gives you an associative algebra. Um, so, for example, uh, like left the left multiplication algebra of the octonions is the Clifford algebra CL zero six, um, right? And if you complexify that, then you you know you easily have a a, a complex algebra. Um, and it does, you know, it would, it might um, be a way to skirt around the problem of having a non-associative algebra. Hmm. Okay, so it looks like Jens has a, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, Howard, did you have any more comments? No, no, no. Okay. Um, that, I mean, the last thing sounds like a cool idea worth pursuing if you can, you know, beef it up to transformations on some, I don't know, module over the octonions or something. Exactly, well, yeah, I've, um, um, I've been working on a project um, that's actually constructed in that in that way, and have uh, a couple of papers that um, have been built uh, using that space. Um, yeah, I'll have to look into them. Yeah, well, I'll, um, I can cool. send you the links. Yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah, no problem. Okay, so uh, Jens, you've got a question here. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just to to add to this, uh, so. Uh, as far as the Octonian, so um, I don't know yet, uh, Marcus, about your uh, the two um, uh, uh, axioms that that you brought. I have to study those, but the the four that go along the direction of of Hardy, you know, you you immediately satisfy the continuous reversibility existing of information unit, and then you uh, no universal encoding. So it would have to be the tomographic locality, and yeah, uh, I would not know where to start to think what that would mean in in nature so yes i mean perhaps tomographic locality is also a bit dispensable <laughs> so howard has worked on how to build meaningful composites of real and quaternionic quantum systems in terms of uh -huh. symmetric monoidal categories or new theories that you can compose systems and there these are not locally tomographic but they have many other nice properties that uh -huh. you would expect from a physical theory to have so I'm, I'm happy to sacrifice local tomography, certainly. OK, thank, thank you for the point. <laughs> yeah. OK, does anybody else have any more questions, comments? OK, yeah. in that case, this might be a good place to, um, to close things off. So I you know, want to say thank you so much, Marcus, for a very stimulating talk. Um, and thank yeah. you, everybody, for um, 
yeah, and, and thank you everybody for you know for showing up and uh, the, yeah, and so many great questions today. Um, uh, so I'd like to announce that we have uh, just one seminar left uh, before taking a bit of a break. Um, on the 13th of June, we have Sean Carroll speaking for us on reality as a vector in a Hilbert space. Um, so thanks again to everybody for showing up and thank you especially to Marcus uh, for, uh, for giving such a great talk. And uh, we hope to see everybody again in a few weeks. Thank you, Cole. My pleasure.